Hey everybody. In this video, I'm going to talk about two types of thinking. Controlled, also sometimes known as deliberate, and automatic. Now, the study of automaticity has been called a number of things over time. Baumeister refers to it as the theory of the duplex mind. But uh, whether, you talk, whether you refer to it as automaticity, as I do, or the theory of the duplex mind, or uh, dual processing, regardless of how you refer to it, all of these ideas carry the idea that we functionally have two, you can kind of think of them as two minds. Some, some refer to the one, one of these minds as the lizard brain, all right? And it's called that largely because we share a lot of the same structures of our lizard brain with lizards, all right? But this is the part of our brain that's responsible for what we might call automatic thinking, or as we will refer to it, type one processing. Called type one because uh, it seems, to, from what we know, it seems to, like it would have emerged earlier in our evolutionary history. And it seems that way because again, we share it with other animals uh, that are non-mammals. And then we have a second mind, all right? Uh, you can, uh, sometimes referred to grossly as the neocortex, um, uh, as, uh, as the producer of controlled thinking. Um, we're going to think, we're going to refer to this type of thinking as type two processing, all right? But you might see it, the Baumeister calls it deliberate thinking. You, uh, through a lot of their readings, uh, it's referred to as controlled thinking. Uh, in fact, you'll see me refer to it as controlled versus automatic thinking. Um, but in the slideshow, I'll try to refer to controlled or deliberate thinking as type two processing and automatic thinking as type one processing. Okay, so I'm going to show you my screen here so you have something to look at and follow along with. So again, we've got automatic thinking, which we will refer to as type one processing, uh, and controlled thinking, which we'll refer to as type two processing. Now, you can think of type one processing as intuitive, all right? It's those automatic thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that you don't really have to think about, don't really have to ponder, all right? They just seem to happen. And then type two processing, you can just think of it as reflective. Type two processing requires more focus. It requires you to pay attention. So we're gonna start by talking about type two processing, all right, or controlled thinking. So here is a series of correlated features, all right? First, awareness. Are you aware that the thought process is occurring, all right? Well, type two processing involves more awareness. So awareness is positively correlated with the type two process. Type two processes have more awareness. Intentionality. Did you intend to engage in that thinking process? Did you intend to think that? All right. Type two processing, again, is positively correlated with that. So uh, type two processing, type two thinking requires us, controlled thinking tends to be more intentional. We tend to, int we, we, we tend to intentionally engage in those thinking uh, processes. Uh, type 2 processing is also far more voluntary, meaning if we want to stop it, we can. All right. It's more easily controllable. Okay. So it's positively correlated with that. Type think, thinking processes that are more type 2 tend to be more voluntary. We can shut them down if we need or want. Type 2 processes are also more effortful. All right. Uh, it, they take something out of us. If we are engaging in it, so think about a day studying, okay? Studying is a type two process. Very often students, I know I do, after a long day of uh, uh, reading and prepping lectures, I feel tired. Why? Well, because I've engaged in type two processing all day and type two processing is effortful, okay? And that kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that it's inefficient, all right? If we, if, if somebody asks us a question while we're studying, your studying is, is, has come to a screeching halt, all right? If you're trying to remember a number and somebody starts asking you a question, 
you're either going to completely ignore the question or you're going to lose the number or you're going to be putting a, you're going to have a lot of trouble keeping dealing with both all right and so for that reason right there controlled thinking or type 2 processing can actually be impaired by things known as cognitive loads basically if we have you think about something other than what you're trying to focus on the thing that you're focusing on suffers all right because type 2 processing is not terribly efficient so efficiency is negatively correlated with uh, thinking that is controlled now what are some of the these are all defining or correlated features right so what are some defining features well one of the defining features is that it type 2 processing controlled thinking requires working memory it, so if you remember when I was talking about its efficiency right if you were to cognitively load someone the type 2 process would suffer that's because a cognitive load consumes working memory working memory is that information in mind that you are currently using now it has a limited span you can't you're not working with all of the information in your mind at the same time all right um, you're only using a limited portion of it because working memory has a limited uh, span it has a limited um, if you think of it think of it in terms of data like on your phone all right or memory rather on your phone right your working memory only has a small amount of memory your the the storage right is pretty big we can store a lot of information but we can only use a small port of part of it any that information at any one time type 2 processing depends on working to uh, on working memory if you load it up if you consume that working memory with any kind of other information type 2 processing suffers so one of the defining features of type 2 processing it requires our working memory another defining feature of type 2 processing is that it involves something called cognitive decoupling that simply refers to the ability to by thinking separate what actually has happened from what could have happened what could in the future happen um, so this is a very reflective process okay so things like hypothetical thought what could be what happens if i do this what happens if i do that metacognition which is thinking about your thinking have i learned this well that's metacognition um am i really confident in what i just said that's metacognition um self-reflection all right uh did i do the right thing right that's metacognition. When you're thinking about your own thinking, that's metacognition. Well, that's cognitive decoupling, all right? You're separating what happened from what could have happened, and you're able to evaluate them. Mental simulation, all right? Uh, you know, many times we might have a run-in with somebody, and, then we, and they got up a good zinger, and we walk away thinking, man, I wish I would have said, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then you reimagine the scenario as if you had said that <clears throat> that's mental simulation you're simulating a series of events that did not really occur even though you know what actually occurred right so again you're decoupling what actually happened from what could counterfactual thinking counterfactual thinking is exactly what it sounds like you have a fact a fact what is true so in terms of behavior you, you have a fact about what you did and you are able to imagine something other than that. How you can imagine having done something differently, all right? Something counter to the fact. So you can think counterfactually. All of these types of thinking require cognitive decoupling, separating what is from what could be or what could have been. All right, these are very reflective processes. Now, some additional evidence that we have that cognitive that type 2 processing um, is very resource dependent meaning it, it's not efficient it takes a lot of effort is our evidence that it requires working memory again if we cog and that comes from the research showing that when you cognitively load someone when you give somebody a secondary task like for example if i asked you to look at something and try to remember it while at the same time 
keeping an eight digit number in memory, that eight digit number that you're keeping in memory, that's tying up working memory. That's a cognitive load. And you're having to keep that eight digit number in memory while you're doing something else. All right, so your working memory is being consumed. It's being taken up. When, when you're cognitively loaded, type two processes will suffer. All right, your ability to think counterfactually, your ability to think what could have been, your ability to uh, engage in mental simulation, these will all suffer when you're cognitively loaded. Think about when you're busy, again, earlier what we were talking about when we were studying and then somebody asks you a question. Think, reflect on when something that, like that happens. Either you quit studying and address the question or you half-heartedly half address the question. Right? So think about, you know, your romantic partner asks you a question while you're studying. Right? I, I know in the past I've probably gotten in trouble because I tried to continue what I was doing and address their question. Well, I did so half-heartedly uh, because my, I was concentrating on something. I didn't have the uh, working memory to address the question. We also know that type 2 processing is correlated with intelligence measures and working memory capacity. So the more information you can hold in working memory, the less encumbered you are, the less slowed down, the less impaired you are by a secondary task. And the better able you can continue to do those things like metacognition while you have an eight digit number in memory, while you're cognitively loaded. So type two processing is Again, prototypically, you're aware of it, you're in, you intend to do it, it's voluntary, it takes effort to do, and it's not very efficient. But those five correlated features are correlated, They're not deterministic. The, de the defining features of type two processing is that it requires working memory, uh, and that uh, it involves reflective processes. Uh, cognitive decoupling, separating what is from what could be or what could have been. Now, because of these limitations, the working memory limitations, and for other reasons, controlled thinking can't do a whole lot. It has a lot of limitations. We've already talked about the working memory limitations. Um, you know, for example, most people can only keep seven plus or minus two things in their memory at one time. That's why when people are cognitively loaded, they're given eight digits, which is one number, one number above what the average person can keep in memory at one time. So it's, it's loading for the average, it's demanding, it's impairing for the average individual. Um, now, we, we do have, we don't have just one type of working memory. We have there's some evidence to suggest that we've got modules of working memory, but each of them have their own limitations. All right. Processing capacity. Controlled thinking has processing, uh, has a process, has an incredibly limited processing capacity. So in the early days of studying automaticity, people became interested in trying to identify just how much processing the conscious mind could do and they tried to use a common metric, the same metric used in computers, specifically a byte. Um, and what they found was that when we're relaxed, when, we don't have, when we're not cognitively loaded, our controlled thinking can process about 50 bytes of information per second. Um, not bad. But if we start doing anything, that number starts going down. All right, so for example, if we start doing a math problem, it drops from 50 to about 12 bytes per second. So it's fairly easy to impair our type two processing. Um, and it's thought that for that reason, we are what we call cognitive misers. We don't like to think, we, we, we are not terribly inclined to think unless we have a reason to. If it's relevant to us, if we're interested in it, unless those things are in place, we don't like to commit our limited type two processing ability to thinking about stuff, all right? Um, this is probably why a lot of people don't think about politics. A lot of people don't like, don't like politics, so they don't think about it. 
they don't they don't learn about their the people they're voting for, right? Um, so politics in particular, <clears throat> and I think for good reason, people avoid it. Um, politics in particular lead to a lot of people being miserly. They don't like thinking about it, and so they are very miserly. They're very they they keep their money. Scrooge in a Christmas a Christmas Carol. He was a miser, all right. He wanted to hang on to his money. Well, we're the same way. We want to hang on to our controlled thinking, all right. We don't have a lot of it to spend, and so we don't like spending it on things we don't, we're not interested in and we don't care about. Our automatic or unconscious processing system, however, our type one processing, however, is remarkably free of limits. It has its limits, but those limits are far uh, weaker than the limits on type two processing. Um, you know, relaxed, controlled thinking can process about 50 bytes per second. Whereas automatic thinking uh, in those early estimates were found, this includes our entire perceptual system, can process up to 11 million bytes per second. 50 compared to 11 million. All right, so automatic thinking is far more capable, has far more processing capacity um, than type two does. Even our ability to control our own behavior seems limited. So, uh, you know, our ability to engage in, let's say, you know, somebody puts a, a plate of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies in front of you and asks you not to eat it, right? Doing that, is going to consume some, some self-control. And what the strength model of self-control suggests is that when you use some of your self-control, yeah, if you give, give it a long enough break, it'll replenish. But if you are immediately asked to do something else that you may not necessarily want to do, the self-control required to perform the secondary task is going to suffer. And so you won't be able to do it as well. Again, we've got these limitations on what we can intentionally, voluntarily um, do. Now, let's talk about type one processing or automatic processing. You'll note, if you go back through this and compare this to the, to the slide where we talk about the correlated features of type two processing, all those correlations are in the exact opposite direction. So automatic thinking, we're less aware of it. It's less intentional. Sometimes we can't really control it it doesn't take much effort at all. Sometimes it'll proceed almost to our surprise. And it's very efficient. It will keep going even if we're tired. All right. So our emotional reactions to things are largely automatic. All right. Ever think about how when you're tired, controlling your emotions get, gets a little harder? This is partly why. Emotions are far more automatic than self-control. Um, when you're drunk, right? When you've had a few drinks, even if you're not drunk, when you had a few drinks, that is a depressant, all right? It depresses and it, uh, your, the activity in your brain, and it starts with your type 2 processing. So when you're drunk, your emotions get expressed a lot more than <clears throat> uh, they would if you hadn't had any alcohol, all right? So the defining features of type two processing, or sorry, type one processing, is that it's independent of working memory. Regardless of whether you're cognitively loaded or not, an automatic process will continue. It'll continue to run. It's like a, it's like a background app on your phone, all right? Um, you, know, you know how you don't have to be looking at Facebook and you'll get notifications that you've got messages or you've got, uh, uh, status updates, things like that. Um, that's because Facebook is running in the background. It runs regardless of whether you turn it on. All right. And you can think of it that way. Right. So automatic thinking is like background apps. And if you ever notice, um, you can have a lot of background apps. They, you can have, your phone could be doing a ton of stuff and you not know it. Well, your brain is primarily automatic. Um, most of what you do is automatic. Even things that we think that we're focusing on are probably automatic. Um, so the, when, we, when we talk, all right, very rarely do we think about each word that we're saying. 
Instead, we have a meaning that we want to convey, and then we open our mouth and words come out because we're automatically choosing which words to say, what word to say them in, right? We're automatically doing that. It's also autonomous, meaning it's not dependent on our intentionality. We don't need to mean to do something. If something is purely automatic, it's gonna run whether we want it to or not. Now we can shut it down if, or many times we can shut it down if we become aware that it's running. So you can go into the app settings and turn off the background data, right, on your phone. And sometimes we can do that with our mind, right? We can uh, basically uh, see what output an automatic process has given us and then stop it. But that autom but we can't do it exactly the same. We can't go into our settings and shut off an automatic program, although I'm sure many of us would like to. We can't, all right? Um, but we can stop the product from displaying, all right? Uh, the analogy, we can stop the notification, you know, that little bubble next to the app in the top right corner of the app that shows you how many notifications you have. We can turn that off, all right? We can see it because it's automatically running, press it, and then close it. So we've turned off that. Th that's functionally what we can do. The automatic system will run, it'll give us a notification, and we can shut, and then we can suppress or shut off the notification, okay? Now, um, what kinds of things are automatic? Well, like I uh, suggested earlier, most of what we do is automatic. And in fact, some people have gone, gone so far as to say, you know, 95 to, 90, 95 to 99% of what we do is entirely automatic. Um, so what does that include? Well, one thing it includes is an innately specified processing modules. What does that mean? Well, if you go back and watch one of my videos about evolutionary psychology, you'll hear me talking about psychological mechanisms. It's like mental apps, all right? These mental apps, they come stuck in our brains when we're born. Just like you've got stock apps that come with your phone when you buy it. When you're born, you come with stock apps, all right? Stock psychological mechanisms that uh, will run whether you want them to or not, okay? So those innately, they're innate, innate, we're born with them, specified. So we're born with them and uh, they're, they're specified, they're created, they're dictated by our history as a species. Processing modules. A module, just a, a single unit that processes some information. All right, so it's innately specified processing module. Basically those psychological mechanisms that we are born with. So automatic thinking includes those. It includes things that we have overlearned. So you can think of them as uh, automatic uh, habits that we've developed. So for example, you might learn some rule, like um, um, always, lock, always put your seatbelt on, and always, uh, when you get in the car and always lock your doors when you get out of your car, right? So the rule is get out of the car, lock the door. The rule is get in the car, uh, get in the car, buckle your seatbelt, right? Well, you can overlearn those to the point where I'll give you a personal example. When I first learned to drive a car, I learned how to uh, drive an auto, a, uh, sta a standard, all right? Um, so I had to push in the clutch. The next vehicle I got was an automatic, but as soon as I got in the car, my left foot went up looking for the clutch, all right? And it did that for several days before I finally got used to it not being there. Well, why? Because I learned the rule that in order to turn on the car, I had to push in the clutch. <clears throat> That's an overlearned rule, all right? Stimulus discrimination, uh, learning the difference between um, shades of blue, right? Um, these become automated. Acquired skills. Those of you who have played basketball or baseball or any sport really, mar a martial art, those who drive, which I'm assuming is most of us, right? If you imagine, if you remember back to when you first got into a car, you can probably remember how nervous you were, how focused you were on every little thing, like the speedometer, how much pressure you were putting on the, on, on, on the pedal, uh, where your hands were on the wheel, 
where you were looking, you were probably paying attention to all that. But now when you get into a car, presumably after you've been driving for years, you still do all those things and you probably do them better than you did when you first got into the car, but you're not paying attention to each of those things. They, you just do them automatically without even thinking about it. In fact, I'm sure some of you have had the experience where you know you get in your car to go home and the next thing you know, you're home and you don't remember anything about the drive. Well, why? Because you did it automatically. You And think about all that you did mindlessly. Think about all that you did without paying attention. You avoided other cars. You stopped at stoplights and went at green lights. <clears throat> when cars pulled in front of you, you slowed down. When you wanted to pass them, uh, you went around them. You, so you did all of that stuff and sometimes you're not even paying attention to what you're doing, all right? Because it's largely automated. Now, in order for the automatic system to work, it has to have all the information. That's why part of the reason why texting and driving is so bad, because when you're texting and you're looking down here, you don't have all the information that your automatic system needs to do its job. So it can't automatically run because it doesn't have all the information. Don't text and drive. <laughs> um, Decision-making rules, right? If I go eat out tonight, I'm not going to eat pizza, all right? Or I'm not going to order a soda, right? That's a decision rule. You're intending to implement a certain rule. Those can become automated, okay? So implementation intention is the intention to implement some decision rule when you encounter a situation. So it's an if-then. If I go out, I'm not going to have soda. Um, when I get home, I'm going to exercise. Uh, when I get to my office, I'm gonna check my mail, my email. For me, it's fill up my giant water bottle, but I haven't been to the office in forever. So uh, when I get back, I'll get there. Freaking quarantine. Well, this is gonna date, that's gonna date this video. <clears throat> anyway. Now, what all can the automatic mind do? Well, hopefully what I just told you gives you some clue. It can basically do everything we do, all right? We can pursue goals, avoiding obstacles. We can make decisions. We can assess how threatening a situation is. We can categorize. In fact, almost all categorization is entirely automatic. When you look at a chair, right? When you look at something with four legs and a platform that's horizontal and another platform that's vertical, you, you, you don't even necessarily think about the elements of it. You just automatically think, oh, chair. Right? Well, you just categorized. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> one of the principal distinctions between experts and novices is how uh, narrow and how precise those um, categories become. Experts have narrower, more specific categories. Novices, people who are new to something, who don't know much about something, their categories tend to be really big and include a lot of stuff that shouldn't go together. Directing attention. There's something called the cocktail party effect. This is when you're having a conversation with one person and you hear your name in another conversation that you're not, a, you're not paying attention to. Well, when you hear your name, it pulls your attention. All right. That's your automatic system evaluating information in the environment without you, paint, without you knowing. And then when it hears something relevant to you, like your name, it pulls your attention to that information. All right, so it's evaluating things around you and you're not even aware of it, right? So it's running automatically. So it can evaluate your environment without even you even knowing. Emotion, I mentioned this earlier in the video. Our emotions are largely automatic. You don't see information, usually, you don't see information and think, you know, I should be happy about that. Yay, I'm happy. That would be a controlled process. That would involve reflection. You don't see something and think, man, I should be pissed about that. <clears throat> and then become angry. No, no, again, that would revol involve reflection. Now you can use reflection to tone down emotion, but we usually don't use reflection to generate emotion. All right, it's automatic. All right, all right guys, and that is it for our discussion of automatic and controlled processing or type, type one, automatic, and type two, controlled process. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. If not, have a great one, and I'll see you later.